the dispensationalists have a very uh, precise, you could say, very detailed understanding of this that kicks off with the rapture, but then follows a, mu a bunch of different uh, other developments. Some of them include the mark of the beast being a literal sort of uh, mark on people that will either would define their allegiance to the Antichrist, which will be this real human figure who will take over the world and have a one world government. Imagine this is a very uh, uh, thriller esque uh, scenario, though it was originally f developed not to be popular popularized, but really to try to make sense of a literal reading of prophecy in the Bible. Hey everybody, welcome back to the podcast. We've got another really excellent episode for you today. My guest is Dr. Daniel Hummel. He is an expert, a scholar of American religion. He currently works at, uh, he's had several different posts, but now his full-time work is at Upper House, which is a Christian ministry on the campus of University of Wisconsin-Madison. The book that we're talking about today is his new book, The Rise and Fall of Dispensationalism, How the Evangelical Battle Over the End Times Shaped a Nation. And if you're like me and you uh, wondered before from time to time, hey, where did this idea of the rapture come from, particularly a, a secret rapture? rapture that the church would be taken up before this very specific seven-year tribulation period followed by another uh, series of very specific events. Well, this book unpacks the history of that movement and how different ideas were spread uh, over time throughout the country. So it's a really fascinating read, really helpful to get our hands around the history of it and some of the complexities that lie therein. If you haven't yet subscribed to the channel, please make sure that you do. Um, you're going to get all of this great content that's that we're constantly putting out. Make sure you've turned on your notifications so that you get the updates. And uh, you could really support us by also just sharing the love. If there are people that you know that are interested in biblical studies, interested in the Christian faith, and going deep with other academics who are really rooted in their scholarship, but also rooted in their Christian faith, then please do share this channel with friends, with family. Um, we'd really, really appreciate that. That would be awesome. And uh, with that, and without further ado, let's go ahead and jump into our episode with Dan. Well, welcome everybody back to the podcast. Really excited today. We've got a treat. I've got Dr. Dan Hummel on the show, and we're going to be talking about his new book on uh, the rise and fall of dispensationalism. That's a term that some people might be familiar with who are listening, but I'm going to also give him a chance to unpack it for us. Uh, but super important topic, right? Anybody who's had questions about the rapture, when is it? Uh, what's the deal with that? Why are so many Christians into support of the state of Israel? Um, a whole ho other host of questions that I know a lot of people ask, like, this seems like something we take for granted. Why is that the case? Dan is the expert on this. He's going to help us unpack the history of that. So welcome, uh, Dr. Hummel. Thanks for being on the show. It's a pleasure to be with you, Max. And as uh, we were just saying, it's fun to talk across disciplines here. I'm a historian. You're a biblical scholar. Always fun to a dialogue across the disciplines. Yeah, super exciting. I was telling Dan, he's the first non-biblical scholar we've had on the show. So I'm excited to have an expert in American religion on the show. This is really exciting because definitely not my area of expertise. I'm a, a dilettante at best when it comes to this stuff. So um, I'm, I'm really excited uh, t for the conversation. Um, would you just begin by giving us a little bit of a background, just kind of your journey into academic study and, uh, you know, maybe how you you're involved, obviously, in ministry on the campus of uh, Madison, Wisconsin. So I'd love to hear just a little bit about your ministry, too, and, you know, kind of how you hold those two worlds together, scholarship and faith. Yeah, and I'll start with uh, where I work. So I'm here in Madison, Wisconsin, uh, right on the campus of UW-Madison, a big public university, about 45,000 students. Um, and I work at a place called Upper House, which is a Christian study center at, on campus. And you can look up the consortium of Christian study centers and see that it's a it's a um, network of like-minded institutions all around the country, largely at big R1 universities, uh, committed to sort of an orthodox Christian theological confession, 
uh, but really geared toward trying to reach the communities on campus in a way that InterVarsity and Crew and a lot of other evangelical type ministries do. But maybe two of the distinctives are that uh, we have a building right on campus, which allows us to bring in speakers and host, actually host those other uh, ministries as well, but do a lot of stuff that you can only do when you have a committed space. And then also most study centers tend to have a number of people on staff who are uh, deep in their disciplines, uh, often with terminal degrees. And so I have a PhD in history from UW-Madison, and there's just so many things you can do on a, in a university culture when you are uh, embedded in the academic part of that culture as well. And so um, I'm a historian, we have a philosopher, we have a social scientist on staff uh, as well, and uh, that's that's usually how study centers work. So uh, yeah, I, I love the work. It, it It's a place that lets me stay on campus. I'm, I, I drive into campus every day, um, but uh, also I'm overtly Christian. Uh, th- there's no way of hiding sort of where I work. And uh, one of the people that a lot of, um, one of the thinkers that a lot of people in the Christian Studies Center movement point to is the sociologist James Davison Hunter, who has a book from about uh, well, almost 15 years ago now, uh, where he talks about faithful presence is sort of the role of the Christian in settings like a major public university. And so we try to be faithful to our uh, to our faith, to our tradition, but also faithful to the community. And then we often see the the biggest value add that we give to our community is being present and being committed to the community, as opposed to maybe some other models of campus ministry that either are trying to sort of save students from the university culture, or I don't see this very much here, but or somehow trying to take over the university or or sort of wage a culture war on campus. We we try to avoid those postures. Instead, the posture of faithful presence is really where we uh, where we land. So that was really appealing to me I, at coming out of grad school, a few different postdoctoral fellowships. So that's where I, I work. And then just quickly about m- me, I grew up a missionary kid in the, you could say, conservative evangelical world. I spent some time in Germany with that and then landed in Colorado Springs, Colorado, which for anyone in the evangelical world, that's sort of a hot spot for evangelicals. A lot of ministries are headquartered or were, I don't, I don't know if it's so much now, but it was in the nineties for sure, headquartered in Colorado Springs. So I grew up in a very uh, Christian home, one that actually uh, conf- sort of followed dispensational theology and we'll get to that, though not in any really uh, cultish way or anything. It was just sort of the received tradition in our family. And uh, I, I, di- I ended up going to public schools for most of my childhood, which uh, exposed me to a much more pluralistic group of people than had I gone to what many of my sort of church friends went to, which were Christian schools where everyone was uh, supposed to be Christian. But uh, I ended up just really um, uh, enjoying learning theology and intellectual history. That's ended up, I ended up being a philosophy and history undergrad major at Colorado State University and then decided I want to make intellectual history sort of the focus of my of my career. Uh, and I was advised early on by a, a PhD advisor here at UW to uh, basically write what you know, which is often given to uh, grad students when you're casting around for where exactly should I invest, you know, the next five to seven years of my life uh, on some very narrow topic. And so I was advised to uh, think about my own tradition, um, and my own religious tradition and think about sort of what would an intellectual historian make of that tradition. And so I, I wrote a, a dissertation on Christian Zionism, which is that you mentioned it, the sort of evangelical, particularly support of Israel, the state of Israel and where that comes from, from sort of a theological intellectual basis. And then I wanted to turn my sights in this next book on dispensationalism, which is a, in some ways, a much bigger topic uh, that covers m- many more uh, centuries of history and uh, many more thinkers and institutions, and and that's where we are now. Awesome, yeah, no, thanks for that intro. It's super cool to hear about the ministry you're doing there. I very much resonate with the the ethos as well. I feel like a lot of Christians are trained to see public educational spaces, uh, secular educational spaces, for lack of a better term, as like a dangerous place. But yeah. my experience has been just the opposite. I, I spent some time in the classics department at UC Davis and uh, absolutely loved it. And it was just the the welcoming posture. I mean, they knew I was Christian there. You know, they knew what I was doing, but it was like, it was wonderful. So 
um, yeah, I, I, I hope more and more Christians take that kind of posture because I think that's what we desperately need. Uh, and I think it's, it's, as you said, it's a faithful presence. So it's really awesome. Um, yeah. All right. So dispensationalism, maybe here's the thing. I I'd like to just start with, if we can define a couple of terms for the audience, because I don't want to presuppose everybody that's listening or watching knows for sure what these terms right. are about. So what would be just like the very quick, and as you point out in the book, something I wasn't aware of till I read it, this term wasn't coined really until the 1920s by Moreau. Is that how you say his name? Moreau. Yeah. Moreau, Philip Moreau. Moreau. Philip yeah. Moreau. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, Basically, he coins the term in a kind of pejorative way after he left the fold, as it were. But but in any case, this is the descriptive term that's used for this kind of theology. So what what would be a very quick kind of over overall explanation of what dispensational theology is? Well, it is a system of theology, so it, it sort of touches on all aspects that any system of theology would. So it's hard to you'd have to sort of catalog all the different ways that dispensationalism is has its own take on things. I think for most people who aren't already familiar with the term, they probably recognize one of the more distinctive teachings of dispensationalism, which is the rapture. Right. And the rapture is actually, th that concept is not unique to dispensationalists necessarily, but the way that it's used in dispensationalist theology is it's taught to be this uh, any moment, so it could happen right now, it could happen a day from now, it could happen a year from now, any moment, sudden taking away or translation of all true believers, all Christians, to meet Jesus in the sky and then go back to heaven. And uh, there's a lot of pop culture that it traffics in, in rapture uh, imagery. The, there's a lot of art. There's a lot of novels. The Left Behind novels are, are probably the most famous ones in recent decades. Uh, th there's even, uh, I, I mentioned it briefly in the book, there's a really good uh, HBO show called The Leftovers, which has nothing to do, it's not written by Christians, or I don't think so, or evangelicals in particular, but it's sort of plot device behind the show is that suddenly 2% of the world just disappears, and it's, it's really following the people after that, and so what does that do to you if if you're wondering, there doesn't seem to be a logic to it. But that, if you go back and read interviews with the authors who developed that idea, they were drawing on rapture ideas to to uh, even make the plot of the movie. So the rapture has really penetrated a lot of our pop culture. It's it's a major distinctive teaching of dispensationalism, but it's not the whole thing. And so there's, there's really, uh, I'll, I'll just focus on two distinctive teachings. Uh, one is the eschatology. So the rapture is part of a broader... Uh, study of the last things, that's what eschatology means, which is what's going to happen at the end of, of history. And most Christians have some take on this. Most of the confessional uh, creeds, the historic creeds, mention the second coming of Jesus, which somehow plays into this. The dispensationalists have a very uh, precise, you could say, very detailed understanding of this that kicks off with the rapture, but then follows a, a bunch of different uh, other developments. Some of them include the mark of the beast being a literal sort of uh, mark on people that will either would define their allegiance to the Antichrist, which will be this real human figure who will take over the world and have a one world government. Uh, you Pro can this probably, probably Eastern European. We're thinking. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, if you, you, that's right. Uh, yeah. Though, though, um, you know, historically. It was assumed to be a Jew, which gets into some of the really, really anti-Semitic kind of anti-Semitic, yeah, yeah. uh, or at least anti-Jewish um, uh, tendencies of some of the dispensationalist teachings. But yes, in the Left Behind novels, it's a, it's a, I think it's Romanian uh, a UN official or something <laughs> that that turns into the to the Antichrist. But that's a big part of it too. So you can imagine this is a very uh, uh, thriller-esque uh, scenario though it was originally f developed not to be popular popularized but really to try to make sense of a literal reading of prophecy in the bible and by literal meaning it, it happens in the world sort of observable like a journalist could observe what's going on and and this would be the the timeline and so that there's a seven-year tribulation where all this stuff is happening. At the end of the tribulation, there will be a major battle, the Battle of Armageddon, a literal battle. And, and that will usher in the second coming of Jesus, where he, he comes down with those raptured Christians to defeat Satan uh, at that battle. And so at the, at the Antichrist, who at that point is the embodied uh, uh, Satan. 
So that, that's a big part of dispensationalism is this eschatology, this whole package of beliefs that uh, many people have made hay about how that leads to different views of society and culture in the future and how dispensationalists have distinctive views of those things. The other thing I'll, I'll point to that is pretty unique about dispensationalism is its understanding of, uh, you could say, ecclesiology or, or who is the church and what is the purpose of the church, what is the mission that the church is on. And for dispensationalists, almost over any other Christians in in church history, dis- make a sharp distinction between Israel of the Bible and today and the church. And so for most Christians, there's an understanding that God worked through ancient Israel in the Old Testament and that when Jesus came, he redefined the covenant between God and humanity to include all peoples and and that would be the church. The church is sort of the covenanted body and that that uh, more or less uh, uh, sacred history goes through the church at that point and and church will the church will be active in uh, spreading the gospel until Jesus returns. Well, dispensationalists do agree that there's a church and that it has a role to spread the gospel, but they don't think that Israel was discarded or replaced, or there's a lot of words that are very highly charged in this conversation. Uh, they, they think that God's covenants with Israel are still active, and so God still has a, a role to play, or Israel still has a role to play in God's plans. And so this is often called the church-Israel distinction in dispensationalist theology, and it really colors how dispensationalists read a lot of the Bible, particularly prophetic passages, which whenever Israel is mentioned for a dispensationalist, it means the literal, uh, a, a, the seed, the genetic line of Abraham, whereas many Christians would read later re- many references to Israel as, as, as uh, foreshadowing the church and, and the, the, the church today or in the future. So that distinction uh, co- colors how even how dispensationalists understand their mission as well. And so, for many dispensationalists, there's a very stark distinction between the world and and the church. Mm-hmm. And there, this comes out of a deeper d- dualism between heaven and earth. And the church should be entirely heavenly minded, entirely otherworldly in its orientation, which means it should focus on missions in particular and discipling the faithful. But it should not. D- for sure be involved in politics or reform movements that are very worldly and in their schema are, are really the the domain of Israel. Israel is God's earthly people. It is their role to establish the millennial kingdom. It is not the church's role. And so you find among dispensationalists, uh, you, historically you'd find a sort of anti-political mm-hmm. approach saying any involvement in politics is a detraction from the, the true purpose of the church. Today, you'll find dispensationalists who are very politically active in yeah. the Christian right. right. But they'll, they'll frame it as uh, they're doing something to protect the church or to protect the liberty of Christians. Mm-hmm. And I see a sort of continuity there, that there's a continuity of privileging the autonomy of the church to fulfill its mission of, of evangelization. And that comes out of this distinction between the church and Israel that, uh, that is at the heart of dispensationalist theology. Yeah, super helpful. Um, and uh, maybe another w- w- little piece to add here too. obviously you talk about in the book for people. One of the things that dispensationalist, dispensationalism does for people is it gives them a really clearly defined system for reading the Bible. So yeah. anywhere you plug yourself in into the biblical story, as it were, you are in a particular dispensation. And so your way of reading that text here totally depends on how you understand God's agreement between people in that particular dispensation. So like as a Christian, you know, as Dan's saying, like we are the churches in this kind of parenthetical season that is, yeah, sandwiched in between Israel and the all the prophecy that, that pertains to Israel gets fulfilled after the parentheses is over, after the church is, is taken up. So it gives people, I think... One of the things it does for people, especially if we're thinking about the nature of American Christianity, very anti-institutional in many ways, kind of grassroots, uh, anti-intellectual in some ways, it gives people kind of like a grassroots system for making sense of the biblical text when you... Well, I want to ask you a question in a moment about the, the Bible reading method, but it strikes me that it, it fits into that general ethos of trying to give people with maybe not so much scholarly training, a very clearly defined system for reading the Bible. 
Yeah, I agree with you. And of course, you're, you're mentioning the where the term comes from. So dispensationalism refers to the dispensations of time where God is dealing with humanity in these different ways uh, based on the covenant or actually based on a, a bunch of different things, but often based on the covenants God, God is making. And yes, it, it gives a, a sort of schema for the entire Bible. And and one really popular form of distributing dispensationalist teachings has been through the reference Bibles or the annotated Bibles that, mm-hmm. that just put footnotes at the bottom of the text to help the reader sort of connect those dots immediately as they're reading. It's really hard when you're, we've all probably read a reference Bible or a study Bible where if you just take a few days and you go back, you forget, was that in the notes or was that in the actual text? And, and that's part of the power of, of the annotated Bible is that if it's done right, the reader just assumes that the notes are expounding obvious truths uh, of the text. But we, of course, know that all, everyone's coming to those texts with particular assumptions and understandings. And that's been one of the really influential ways dispensationalists have continued to be influential and continue to to perpetuate their teachings is that they are very good at, at the reference Bibles and the study Bibles. Yeah, right. Like the Schofield reference Bible Schofield, would be the yeah. big one. And also the charts too, right? Like you yeah. talk about that yeah. earlier in the book, the reference of the end time charts. Those are really powerful too, because it sets out this very particular schema for people. And they're like, oh, okay, just slot this in here. This gets slotted in here. It all fits. It's like a puzzle, right? And they're giving you the instructions on how to put the whole puzzle together. And there you go. Yeah, and there might be an outside perspective that dispensationalism, because it's been associated with fundamentalism and other things, is sort of anti-modern or against modern ways of of thinking. And in some ways that's true, very, very dead set against biblical criticism and other things. But in other ways, dispensationalism is very modern. It's very, it comes out of the 19th century. It's about categorizing and organizing time and, and the Bible. And so those charts, which people can go up and go online and look at Larkin charts. Uh, uh, Clarence Larkin was one of the, the famous uh, chart artists, I guess you could call him. They are very clear, or they're not clear. They're very sophisticated, and they look like a machines almost because they're trying to draw very distinct lines between periods of time or covenants or peoples or all the different things that dispensationalists want to categorize. And that comes out of a deeply modern sensibility yeah. of wanting to bring reason and order to every aspect of the Bible and make it all sort of fit fit together nicely. And that that's still part of that uh, that ethos of dispensationalism today. Yeah, 100 percent. There's a kind of a scientific precision to it, in a sense, right. or at least that's what it's aiming at. Yeah. Right. Um, all right. So I'd love to hear a little bit about uh, John Nelson Darby. I know um, I know a little bit about the guy. No more now having read your book and um, anybody that's spent any time, you know, digging into dispensationalism or if you Google it, I'm sure his name pops up or if you Google Rapture, right, his name's going to pop up. Yeah. But he's a more complex figure than is often, uh, you know, led on or at least kind of popularly known. So I'd, I'd love to hear just a little bit about him, what stuck out to you as you're reading. What actually happened at these uh, prophetic house parties that he was, was hosting? It sounds really fun. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if it was that fun, actually. Uh, yeah, no, of... actually, it, it, yeah, <laughs> probably not. <laughs> I think it was basically uh, morning to evening teaching was happening at the house parties. Uh, so gotcha. I guess that'd be fun to, to some level, yeah, I guess. Yeah, you got to mix it up a little. Come on. <laughs> right. And, and the house parties were these eight. These are so we're going back to the 1830s. So almost 200 years ago. And this, this, these took place in Britain. Uh, they were part of a broader, you could call them dissenter or separatist part of the British Protestant world, where people were uh, reading anew the prophetic parts of the scriptures and, and developing new insights, you could say. And, and one of the key figures there was a guy named John Nelson Darby. He ends up founding the Plymouth Brethren movement, which is still with us. And it's actually quite you, you find brethren all over the place in American religious history. Uh, but he founded, he was one of the founders of the Plymouth Brethren. And the Brethren were a radical Protestant sect that taught that, uh, and this is Darby that, that propounded these teachings, taught that the entire Anglican church, and in fact, every state church in Europe was apostate because it had become too in, intertwined and enveloped in worldly interests, and particularly empire. That was that was one of the critiques of Darby. Was the the Anglican Church was basically an arm of the British Empire. This was never what God intended for the Church to be. I think a lot of people today could sympathize with that critique. Yeah. 
uh, in, in any age. But Darby's solution to that was to break away. He was actually an Anglican priest, and he, he quit and left the fold to break away and found a sect that was entirely otherworldly. And you see here where that distinction I was making between sort of worldly and otherworldly purposes of the church. Darby was really a stickler on this, that brethren should not be involved in any way in politics, as he understood them, or in any type of reform movement. And there were a ton of reform movements in the 19th century to be a part of if you were a Christian. And that the, the really the role of, of the Christian was to be part of the missions movement and to spread the gospel. Darby also developed the beginnings of the whole eschatology side, the rapture and the Antichrist, and this came out of his need to read the Bible through this church-Israel distinction, and he needed to sort of line up everything and have it make sense, and a lot of the resulting prophecy teachings, or the teachings about the end times, come from his method just being worked through those parts of the Bible. It's not like he, he didn't really have a, a, a obsessive fascination with the old with the end times uh, it was definitely there he was much more concerned about having a pure church and uh, and that, that really drove him so the brethren were interesting in part because they wanted everyone to leave denominations or established churches they also didn't believe in clergy they thought that was a innovation from the new testament church they're very primitivist in their understanding of the church one reason they're called the brethren is because they refuse to be called anything else and so outsiders just called them the brethren from Pr plymouth and so they became the plymouth brethren so when darby uh when darby starts developing his system he is a he's a bachelor for his whole life he just travels the whole world his whole life he lives for 82 years he dies in 1882 he ends up spending seven years in the U.S. in the 1860s and 70s, which is a very pivotal time in U.S. history. That's the Civil War and Reconstruction era. And Darby does not care about that stuff. As I meant, he just doesn't really, he's not really invested in the Civil War. He does observe it a lot. So if you go through his diaries and his letters, he's, 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 not, um, he's not ignorant of what's going on. He just doesn't think it's anything that Christians should care about. But uh, he, he ends up meeting people who are really interested in this otherworldly vision of the church, in part because the world's so awful for most people in the 1860s and 70s in the U.S., and because, in particular, pastors are having a very difficult time navigating the political winds, uh, particularly around race, and I get into that in, in detail in the book, uh, related to the church and, and what's the church's role in advocating for or against slavery, depending on where you are in the country in the 1860s, and then during Reconstruction, how to advocate for or against racial justice, and then uh, once we get to the Jim Crow era, what's the position to take on, on that? And many pastors were looking for, uh, not necessarily in any instrumental way, but looking for ways to make sense of that, that aligned with their, many of them had built-in senses that they didn't want to do this. This wasn't the church's role to sort of adjudicate these things. So Darby ends up getting some uh, traction with pastors in the U.S., particularly in, in border states, states that were northern in the Civil War but had strong southern cultural sympathies, which was where there was very tense uh, church life after the Civil War. And uh, he gets people that are interested in his teachings on the church and also on the end times. It's, it's a very apocalyptic moment in, the, in American history. He does not get many pastors to leave their denominations or renounce the the, being clergy. So he's actually very frustrated because that's his, if he could choose, he'd rather they do that than adopt his teachings on the end times. Uh, but that's not what Americans do. They, they take his ideas and use them to their own devices. And so one thing I wanted to do in the book was get away from the idea that sometimes has cropped up in other histories that really what dispensationalism is, is just uh, Darby's teachings passed on from Darby to the present without really any any reflection or change. And I actually think it's the opposite, that once Darby spreads these ideas out and some sort of sort of throws seeds out there, he's really out of the picture. He doesn't have any control over how people take his ideas. And he gets pretty, by the end of his life, he's pretty frustrated by that. And so he gets credit for uh, introducing a lot of uh, Americans to distinctive teachings about the end times and about the church and about how to read the Bible. But he doesn't really get to dictate how how Americans take that. And that's where the story continues on and has a largely American cast of characters after that. Yeah, that, that was, that definitely stuck out to me is, man, this guy actually was pretty frustrated with his experience in many yeah. ways. And, you know, you pointed out several things. One was he actually wasn't like the rapture stuff was part of his larger attempt to work out, you know, what he saw going on in the Israel church distinction and time and schema and all this. Um, 
And, and also, he was not opposed to reading scripture symbolically or allegorically right. in places, which really changed when his stuff came to the United States. Because what you had was, as you know, it, it was funny because I was laughing as I was reading it. It's like, yeah, of course, this is how it would happen in America. This is exactly how, you know, it's not the theologians that really are the the people that take the ball and run with it. It's the circuit preachers and the right. the, the Whitfields and all. You know, of course, Darby's teachings are going to be distilled down to whatever Americans want to do with it. Then it's going to proliferate from there. So yeah, it's the it's they pick up on the rapture big time and a couple other things, but the some of his major aims are just kind of left by the wayside so it's really interesting to see that uh, yeah that and darby this. darby really did not like for example revivalist preaching he found it to be cheap he called it cheap and it was much more about emotion than any type of real um thinking and so it's you know deeply ironic that the person who really popularizes his ideas is dwight moody the biggest revivalist of the late 19th century so yeah there, there's a there's an irony there uh, people are noting that uh, the the other brethren who are around darby note that uh you know he's getting popular but not for the reasons he wanted to be so it's, it's a key part of the story and it, it also gets away from a sense that um and this wasn't the main part of the book, but th there's a lot of debates within the conservative evangelical world about the sort of provenance of dispensationalism. Because we're already talking here, it's only a few hundred years old, that for many Protestants that, that sort of disqualifies it as, as any type of legitimate system. But I wanted to really focus on where we should focus, which is the generations after Darby who develop it into an ism, a dispensational ism, a whole system of theology. And there you can, I think that's the proper way to, to sort of adjudicate what the validity of this system is, more than just attributing it to this eccentric uh, Anglo-Irish uh, ex-priest uh, but to really uh, give him credit uh, and 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 understand I think the other thing is understand why he was appealing when he was why wasn't he appealing in the US in the 1850s nearly as much and why wouldn't he maybe have been appealing a couple of decades after he was but why was the 1860s and 70s such a crucial moment for American openness to his ideas mm. And and this idea too so he uh, basically invents this new idea of a rapture as a kind of secret event that happens yeah. uh, prior to the tribulation, which now, I mean, so many people in the United States still take for granted is that's yeah. what the, the Bible teaches. So do you have a sense of like, I mean, aside from that, this, there was a kind of apocalyptic moment in the United States when that teaching comes in, what I, I guess we have largely to credit his successors in helping spread that and make that such a, a key component of American evangelicalism in some ways. Like I, I found in talking about the Bible with people, there are a few things you can challenge that get people worked up to the extent of even suggesting that there isn't a pre-trib rapture uh, right. of, of Christians. I mean, people really get worked up about this idea because it's so central. It's so ingrained. Um, so I'd love to hear your thoughts on that. I mean, one other thing that I was kind of chewing on as I was reading through the book was, so you talk about the development of this Bible reading method, which is mm -hmm. kind of a common sense hermeneutics, right? It comes out of Scottish Enlightenment philosophy, something I talk to students all the time around the, the, the kind of idea about biblicism and, you know, this way of, hey, you know, if you just kind of apply your common sense to the text and read it at its face value, what we call the plain sense of the text, that's the best way to read the Bible. Um, and it seems to me that when you take rapture theology and, and, and say that's the common or plain sense thing, part of what I'm wondering is if people feel threatened about the rapture, any critique of the rapture, because that's actually a critique of their whole way of reading the Bible. And so that that would be deeply threatening, right? If you if you tell me I'm off on one interpretation of the Bible, that's one thing we can have a conversation. But if you critique something that basically unravels my whole way of reading the Bible, well, now I, I'm feeling threatened. So I'm just curious to yeah. hear your your thoughts on that. I think you're right, and it's not much different, though it's, it's probably not as prominent as readings of Genesis one, and and how you're you're. What, however you read that do you read it literally do you read it symbolically do you read it like someone like john walton would which is sort of this ancient near east uh myth mythology polemic uh 
uh, that that's really going to be indicative of of your whole method and this is the the rapture is another one of these so it's it's bundled up with all these other teachings it sort of touches on a doctrine which other parts of the bible wouldn't necessarily do that but i think you're right i think by the early 20th century by the time of the fundamentalist movement for many for many fundamentalists one's teaching on the rapture really was indicative of are you a liberal or are you a fundamentalist are you a modernist or a fundamentalist and there, there's there's some truth to that in the sense that people did bundle these things. So if you did have a pre-tribulational view of the rapture, you probably would be a fundamentalist in in a lot of other um, positions. But that's a historical development. There's no given in 1850 or 1870 that that needs to happen. That happens over time. And I think part of it is the 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 institutional growth after Darby dies. Uh, in 1882, and he has successors that are popularizing this stuff, and then Dwight Moody picks it up. A lot of what becomes the the spine, the backbone of modern American evangelicalism is built. And the three areas I, I look at are particularly the Bible Institute uh, network, which now constitutes many of the Christian colleges that are still around, were founded as Bible Institutes. These were really short-term, originally short-term educational institutions to train missionaries because the overriding concern for someone like Dwight Moody was to get the global missions movement going because the rapture was coming and we needed to save as many people as possible. So the entire Bible Institute movement is largely founded by people who are dispensationalist or, or would be dispensationalist if the term was around at the time. Um, a second one, which is a little less uh, familiar maybe, is the Bible conference movement. We don't have as many Bible conferences anymore, but for most of American religious history, up until a couple generations ago, the Bible conferences were the major way people would gather to study the Bible together. And there were not just Bible conferences, but prophecy conferences where the entire focus was on prophecy, maybe recalls those prophetic house parties of, of Darby's era. But these would be all around the country. Some of them would meet every year. Some of them would be moving. And, and particularly for the leadership, the clergy in the evangelical world, these were really crucial to forming how they viewed the Bible and theology. And so those were largely influenced by dispensationalism as well. And then the third is the global missions infrastructure, which includes dozens of, of missions. Many of them are still around today and thousands of people who are working in those missions, uh, missions agencies. The mission, the global missions movement in the late 19th century was really infused with a lot of dispensational uh, thinking as well. So by the time you get to 1910 or 1920, a big part of just the infrastructure of American evangelicalism is being influenced by uh, dispensationalism. Not all of it, and that's a really Im important point, is it doesn't sort of take over all of evangelicalism or fundamentalism. There's still very strong redoubts of, you could call it denominate, conservative denominationalism, of a very strong covenantalist or reformed uh, body of thinking and, and teaching. But for the more uh, revivalistic, the more interdenominational parts of evangelicalism, this is the thoroughgoing theology. And so I see a lot of that literalism tied up with this stuff really coming out of the fundamentalist era. You even see, if you go back and you look at the original Schofield Bible, so this is Cyrus Schofield, a lieutenant of Dwight Moody. He creates the first really popular reference Bible that has dispensationalist notes under it. There are hundreds of uh, allegories and analogies and types and anti-types that Schofield is finding in the Bible. And these are all things that a literal reading would push you away from. You don't want to do types and anti-types. That gets you into all these symbols and, and, and he, abstractness. He, he had a, a day uh, a day age theory of creation too, as you pointed out in the book, which was right. was also he interesting. Wasn't, yeah. Yeah, he wasn't a literalist when it came to the six days of creation. He did acknowledge that that was one of the options in his notes, but he said the best option was this one that is really not popular anymore, which is that between Genesis uh, 1, 1 and 1, 3, there is an unde sort of undefined millions of years so that you could account for uh, basically an entire history of civilization and then skeletons and everything. Really weird. I mean, it's almost like sci-fi type stuff where there's a hidden hidden civilization or something. But for a lot of people, 
in that mode and sort of conservative evangelical mode of the early 20th century, that seemed to be the right reading, not the literal six days of creation reading that would date the earth to about 10,000 years. So that literalism is a pretty recent, it's about 100 years old and sort of coming in alongside the dispensationalist reading. And what's really crazy to me as a historian is by the 1960s, so just two generations later, it is seen as the defining mark of dispensationalism in some ways. It's, mm-hmm. it's along with the church-Israel distinction, the theologian Charles Ryrie makes the, the historical grammatical plain reading of the text as the other defining mark of dispensationalism. That's and that's one reason you can't go from Darby just straight ahead, because Darby would not have read the Bible in any way close to that way. Right, right. Would he have come to this idea of the rapture if he was reading it in a plain sense way? I wonder. <laughs> Most outsiders would say no, because it, it's it. You have a whole sort of a lot of assumptions you're bringing to the text. Yeah, uh, and that's been one. Of, that's one of the challenges I see as a, as a historian, as an outsider to some of the more technical conversations, is that the 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 history of dispensationalism has been one moving from a set of teachings that were largely derived by an allegorical reading, at least partially allegorical reading. Of, of scripture that was Darby and the Brethren. And then it moved to a more literalistic reading. But the, the people who did the literal reading have had to claim that the, the teachings actually come from the literal reading. They don't right. come from the original type of reading. And that's just been a, it's sort of like a square peg in a round hole type thing yeah. where, you, and, and some people can, can sort of shove it in there a little better than others. <laughs> but I've never, uh, and I've, if you go deep enough, some, some, Honest dispensationalists will talk about these problems, and it, it, there are ways to intellectually get around them and to, um, you know, none of this stuff actually, in, on some on some sort of normative way, discounts any of these ideas. Like it, it could still be true that uh, Darby was right and and all that, but but historically it becomes a problem. And I, I'd say one thing dispensationalists aren't great at, as I've read a lot of them, is really grappling with their own history. They have a mm. very clean version of their history. And 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 they don't want to have a history. I mean, that's part of the the primitivist part of the evangelical tradition. You're, is you're the just re- you're just reading the Bible, right? You're not interpreting right. it. You're just reading it, like yeah, right. And we're just doing the same thing that the first the early church was doing. Like, there's no innovation happening here. Anything we're finding is is already in the text, or we're rediscovering after centuries of bad interpretations or something. But that does not produce a culture that's that can easily be self-reflective on the shortcomings of particular generations in the past. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And the other thing that, I mean, just to complicate all of this too, and I feel this from a perspective of as a biblical studies person, right? Like when I try to bring in historical critical scholarship on say the book of revelation into the classroom, I'm already anticipating all of these obstacles because I'm bumping up against systems of thought that are predicated on the idea that you have to throw out historical critical scholarship. So, so all of this stuff is being developed with no interest in the question of like, what was John the seer talking about in late first century Asia minor, or if it is, they're just assuming that what they're talking about is exactly what he, he was talking about. So he's, you know, seeing flying helicopters around and he doesn't know what to call them. So he calls them locusts or, you know, or something like that. Yeah. Right. And that's, that's a, maybe a distinction though, maybe a distinction between theologians and biblical scholars in some way. So theologians come to the text and often are trying to develop a systematized way of approaching the text, though there's plenty of theologians who do really good uh, background work as well. But I do think it's interesting much later in the story when uh, progressive dispensationalism develops, which is this critique within. Um, I haven't really thought too deeply about this, but most of the people critiquing it are biblical scholars. Yeah, I noticed that you listed people like Daryl Bach and others yeah. like that. Yeah, and yeah. Craig Glazing. And, yeah. Yeah, and, and I just wonder if there's a way where, uh, and there's certainly been outside of the dispensationalist fold, some of the biggest critics of dispensationalism have been New Testament scholars. So people like George Eldon Ladd was a New Testament scholar. And I just wonder if, if part of the tension for people like that who like lad grew up in dispensationalism but then rejected it and i wonder if part of that was him bringing a different set of methods to the text and coming with pretty different conclusions about what we should be doing with the text than would a systematic theologian who's already steeped in in dispensationalism yeah no that that makes sense it's really hard 
like once you've done that kind of training to read text in their original context, so they spend a lot of time. It's so hard to make the leap from that to dispensationalism. It just seems like we're going off into la la land. But mm -hmm. if you're coming at it from the other angle and that's what you've been taught, the text is about, and you've been kind of taught to be suspicious of, you know, scholarly findings anyway, then yeah. it's like we have two ships passing in the night almost. And right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. It's really interesting. Yeah. Um, I'd love to hear your thoughts just a little bit about, so we've talked about fundamentalism. That's a term that came up, but one of the things you point out in the book is there is also some tensions between some dispensationalists and fundamentalists. And also um, there are other groups like that are major groups that are growing like Pentecostals um, who are taking over certain things from dispensationalism, but not, but rejecting a lot of it. Uh, obviously, historic black churches aren't interested in a system of theology right. that separates or spiritualizes the faith because it has no earthly value then to work towards social, racial justice and progress. Um, and, and yet, so it seems to me, I don't want to be over, overly simplistic here, but it seems to me that the big one that almost everybody takes over or at least takes seriously is this idea of the rapture um, and certain end times stuff, even though a lot of the other dispensational stuff people are kind of cautious about, or, you know, if you're a fundamentalist culture warrior, you know, you're going to need to be innovative in terms of how you mm -hmm. take over some of the dispensational stuff. So yeah. What is there, is there a common thread that like, because I have many friends and family members who come out of more Pentecostal circles and I don't know if they would describe themselves as dispensationalists, but they certainly hold to all of the rapture teachings, the charts and all that kind of right. stuff. Yeah, and it gets messy. So uh, just like people pick and pick and chose from from Darby what they wanted, that, that happens every generation. And Pentecostalism emerges in the early 20th century, and really because of its embeddedness in other networks that were teaching dispensationalist type theology, it started just adopting some of the particularly eschatology it doesn't totally fit in well with other parts of pentecostal theology but that's not you know people don't just sit at home and come up with rational uh, systems there's an actual history to be lived and and so um so pentecostalism has a big uh, legacy of that and actually one you know my book is called the rise and fall of dispensationalism part of the fall is that particularly in pentecostal circles there's been a pretty conscious effort in the last couple generations of theologians to get rid of dispensational accretions or whatever they want to call them in their theology because they recognize at a certain point oh this this is sort of a foreign uh, entity in our theological system and uh anyway so so th there's a conscious move to that and that sort of just affirmed to me as a historian that i was on the right track when you see people doing that in these other traditions but uh, the rapture becomes the dominant uh uh teaching that is passed on, I think partially because it is so visually interesting that pop culture and even pop religious culture really has a lot a lot of different iterations of, of, of the rapture to talk about. And so one of the best-selling books of the late 19th century was a book called Jesus is Coming by William Blackstone, who was a, a moody guy and a, and a dispensationalist. Uh, but uh, And it's a whole book about the the whole system of dispensationalism. But the part that he was asked to talk about the most and and really uh, meditate on the most was the rapture moment. It was called the Blessed Hope. It is called the Blessed Hope in dispensational circles because so much of what dispensationalists are reading in the world is this declensionist premillennial narrative, this idea that the world will get worse and worse until Jesus comes back. And then supernaturally, uh, well, things get really bad for the tribulation period, but then Jesus will come and establish the new heavens and the new earth. And so almost everything from the early 20th, mid 20th century, the world wars, the Great Depression, these things are seen as predictable data points of a premillennial uh, decline in in the world. And the rapture is the thing that you can put your hope in, that God has promised that the church will not go through the wrath. This is how they would talk about it. And so the rapture is the thing that will give you um, solace. For outsiders, for critics, it's called an escape hatch. It's basically saying, hey, no matter what happens, we're just going to get out of here and uh, no skin off our back <laughs> type thing. Though, right. of course, dispensationalists did not live their lives like that. They bought houses wanted their kids to go to school. Like, they didn't live like it was coming. Uh, 
Um, and they also were committed to missions. And I think as someone who grew up in that world, I can certainly affirm that, that they really did have a burning urgency from Dwight Moody on to get the word out as quickly as possible because no one knew how much time was left. And mm. so if, if, if any listeners or anyone does appreciate some aspect of the missions movement, and I know there's a lot of critiques of, of global missions out there, uh, there's probably a dispensationalist in the past that has shaped your corner of, of the missionary world just because yeah. of their, their prominence. Yeah. But um, I also think that that broader premillennial view of, 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 the, of history plays in well with a political conservatism that emerges in the 20th century as well. And so that's one way that something like the rapture is not ever, ever really spoken in political uh, circles, but it's underlying assumptions about where the world's going and sort of what we need to do to protect ourselves plays into broader political, cultural discussions in the U.S. that, uh, particularly around the, the issue of conservatism, by the 1940s and 50s, makes dispensationalists themselves openly politically conservative. And they, they say as much because of their reading of the Bible, because of their understanding of history and where, where they think history is going. They see a, a conservatism that is skeptical of reform movements, is, is skeptical of uh, any attempt to make the church sort of the spearhead of, of the civil rights movement or anything else as really against what God wants the church to be. So there's a lot of ways that the, the life of, of a teaching like the rapture or, or of dispensationalism gets uh, lived out in all these different sectors of, of history and society. Yeah, yeah. So it fits really well into the idea that the church's role is to preach the gospel, trying to get as many conversions as you possibly can, but your participation in, like, let's say, the, the good of your neighbor or whatever— it's at best secondary, and it, it, at worst, it could actually be a distraction from what you're supposed to be be doing or whatever. So that kind of yeah. dichotomizing of of the Christian life, right? The spiritual and the earthly or whatever. Yeah, and they would say uh, on an individual level, dispensationalists would be as nice and kind as anyone else. Um, sure. Sort of uh, love your neighbor, all that kind of stuff. Uh, many, many dispensationalists, dispensationalism is largely a white evangelical fundamentalist movement. Many of them were against Jim Crow on a, on an individual level, but they saw the church speaking in any type of, uh, unified way on that as a, as a massive breach of what the church should be doing. And so if you pull back and you just think, well, if that's your position, if your position is anything beyond individual sort of uh, kindness or charity is a distraction for the church that's often meaning an implicit vote for the status quo it's meaning right. let's not let's just not um get involved in anything yeah and so we can look back now and critique uh, depending on your politics now i guess but for those of us who think the civil rights movement was a good thing we can critique uh fundamentalist churches dispensationalist churches for basically sitting that one out because they thought they were more important that's a charitable reading a, a less charitable reading is that they were uh, at least some of them were racist and and didn't want civil rights but for the many millions who who were, were maybe individually fine with uh, equality under the law, they still had a position that, that the, the, the church should not be involved in this issue, mm -hmm. which meant, um, you know, King, Martin Luther King talked about sort of lukewarm Christians or Christians who didn't want change uh, unless it was very slow and gradual. Mm -hmm. And I think he had in mind there a lot of Southern Christians, but you could group a lot of Northern Christians, yeah, white 100%. Christians in that as well. Yeah, absolutely. It reminds me of the divi divided by faith, right? That the study is now 20 years or so old, but just the same kind of mentality that I think you see broadly within evangelicalism. But this is a main component of what white evangelicalism in the United States looks like. So, yeah, it make it it fits really well with that that whole idea. Um I think a big part, what came away with me, I'm not trying to be overly simplistic here, but your rise and fall narrative, I felt like a big part of the story of the fall of dispensationalism was actually that what you call scholastic dispensationalism. So the kind of like rigorous theological energy behind dispensationalism at places like Dallas Theological Seminary and Biola, um, that they were so successful in shaping the minds of some of their students that then their students went out and kind of popularized it again and in sort of popularizing it, just like with it was almost like Darby Redux, like the the same kind of um, like success in some areas. And so what they really took off with was the again, the end time stuff and 
again, American culture, right? Bring it into pop culture, pop religion. That's where we live in America. And so that becomes the thing that really wins the day. So it's the Hal Lindsay's and LaHaye's that end up really getting to control the narrative on what dispensationalism is. These are people that were students of the scholastics, but um, but they end up becoming the the ones that are carrying the, the baton, broadly speaking. Right. That's a, yeah, that's an interesting reading. That's a Darby Redux. Um, I, I think the difference might be so we're talking about someone like Hal Lindsey went to Dallas Theological Seminary in the 50s and 60s became a campus ministry worker and as a campus ministry worker in the 60s he was at ucla he developed a very uh, appealing trendy youthful way of talking about the end times that he put into a book called the late great planet earth which ended up selling 10 million copies in the 70s best-selling nonfiction book of the decade besides the bible and then it sold tens of millions after that as well and became for many people a sort of defining religious text of the 70s. And it claimed to decode all of the geopolitical happenings around the world, Cold War, Middle East wars, all that kind of stuff in a dispensationalist mode. Um, I think where I, so someone like Lindsay ends up becoming massively wealthy, massively influential in both the consumer, commercial, religious world on TV, selling books, all that kind of stuff. Um, and also in the political world, he gets very involved in, conservative politics in the 70s, in, particularly in the 80s, uh, really is a champion of increasing Cold War tensions to try to fight off the Soviet Union. Uh, someone like, like Lindsay, he was trained in the whole system, but he really makes his bones on the end time stuff. That's, right, his, right. Um, that's his thing. And, you know, there, there's a version of that where, um, unlike Darby, who I think the end times was in there, but not the main show. For someone like Lindsay, that is the main show. And and, uh, you know, I, I th that part of the fall for me is I, I'm not a huge fan of that type of religious culture. And so I see this as sort of a degradation of of Christian popular culture into something that's pretty. Uh, yeah, it's pretty crude. Um, pr just on the surface of it, Lindsay's predictions don't pan out. You know, he predicts certain things that will happen in the 80s and then the 90s and the 2000s. And he has no qualms, sort of like a sports uh, better today. Just, okay, well, I was wrong with that prediction. Here's my next one. And it seems like people really enjoyed more the authenticity of who he was than any accuracy um, that he had with his predictions. And, of course, things like the fall of the Soviet Union are major. He, had, he, he, wasn't, he didn't predict that. Uh, it just happened, and then he sort of had to adapt to it. And, uh, and this becomes uh, tied up with... Um, conspiracy theorizing and, and other things in the 90s and, and after. So I see that as sort of a fall from, yeah. I don't even, you know, I don't know what the pristine version of, of evangelical pop culture was, um, but this is certainly a version that I think has had a pretty damaging effect on the way still millions of Christians think about the world, think about politics. And uh, if you go on the Amazon bestseller list, even today, and if you go into sort of the, the Christian eschatology sub section yeah. most of the books on there are are just sort of popular takes on the 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 politics of trump and everything else from a prophetic lens yeah. i don't think that's what should be forming christians uh, as much as it is i guess that would be the the fall for that but yeah. it does come from a uh, it doesn't come from nowhere so it comes from the 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 writers and the television personalities being trained early on in their lives in the dispensationalist system and then them plugging into the consumer and political worlds uh, when they're adults to to sort of adapt it to those to those sectors. Yeah. Yeah. No. And that, that is, I was kind of thinking about the connection because Darby comes to the U.S. with a whole way of thinking. But what p gets taken out of that is the rapture primarily. Right. And in the right. same way with the scholastics, they've got a whole their a whole system that they were teaching. But what gets popularized again is end time stuff and how that plays into novels and geopolitical events and all this kind of stuff. Um, right. Yeah. So it, it's interesting. Like we're at this moment now where you can trace the long intellectual history of like how we got here. And it's so fascinating. And I guess the question I have is where do you think we, we go from here? Cause we both agree that this is massively unhealthy. Um, I try to come at it from a, uh, 
uh, perspective of biblical studies, like showing people like, hey, this is what Revelation is doing. It's a little bit more complicated. Um, let's understand what was happening in the first century. Certainly, let's think about how God is speaking through the text to us today. Um, but not in this kind of one for one thing, right, where all of these predictions are predictions for 21st or whatever uh, events. Yeah. Um, but it's so ingrained, right? This idea of a kind of whole rapture culture and uh, a, uh, an obsession with geopolitical events and events surrounding the nation of Israel that just doesn't seem to be going away. And yet when I interact with younger students, they're not familiar with the major players. They're not right. familiar even so much with all of this stuff, but they do know the rapture like that. So it, yeah, there's just like these components that it seems like they're, they're, they're stuck there. And I just wonder how we, how you think about it as a historian, like, what would suggest what would history suggest would be some way, some helpful ways to respond and mm. maybe like push forward toward a more healthy uh, expression of the christian faith one thing that just always comes to mind when i'm thinking about this is um the fall so the, the fall dispensations if it did fall and i've i've heard from dispensations themselves who claim it hasn't fallen, and I'm just uh, I'm not telling the right version of the story. But if it really has moved from the sort of mainstream of evangelical scholarly life, which I think is pretty pretty clear, it has. We're only it's only been like that for a couple decades. So we're talking in historical time, not that long. So I do think we'll see a shift, uh, maybe not entirely on the popular level. I don't think end time speculation. Uh, it might not be dispensationalist. It might be some other way of doing it. I don't think that's going away. I think that's a, a permanent part of American pop culture. But I do wonder if the particularly dispensationalist interpretations in, say, 10, 20 years when uh, the, the people who are doing it now have aged out, mm -hmm. uh, I wonder. I wonder if it'll mm -hmm. still be as obvious um, as, as a sort of a pop theology. Uh, and I would say, in terms of moving forward, I think one of the lessons that the fall, the scholastic or scholarly fall of dispensationalism tells me is that institutions really matter, particularly seminaries and institutions that teach people how to read the Bible really matter. And one of the, one of the ways dispensationalism lost the scholastic battle was that it failed to produce new generations of scholars who inherited the tradition without deeply critiquing it. And that uh, that particularly happened at, even at Dallas Seminary, so the, the citadel of dispensationalist teaching. I mentioned this earlier, progressive dispensationalism, which I don't really think should be called dispensationalism. It's, it looks much more like its competitor theologies, the covenantal views with a few distinctives that come through the dispensationalist uh, uh, story, but, but really not. That actually emerged at Dallas Seminary by younger students in the 80s who were in some ways the first generation to be really historically aware of where the theology came from. And they wrote a lot about this in the 80s and 90s and developed progressive dispensationalism, which if you, at the time, if you talk to the older faculty, the people who were cla what we now call classic dispensationalists, they really felt threatened by this and they did not like this. Um, but this all happened within seminaries. It, it was a pretty academic conversation. Most people, if they're not pastors or seminarians of some sort, don't even know, you know the difference. But it really did happen, and it's, it's a major part of why dispensationalism today is far less popular. It's because there was a major critique within its own uh, ranks in the, in the 80s and 90s. So that you can take heart, I guess, if you're not a dispensationalist, that um, the institutions matter. People should invest in the institutions. People should uh, cherish them. One of the things that dispensationalists did not do well is use all of the massive popular culture appeal to reinvest in their educational institutions. Someone like Hal Lindsey, uh, he did give some money back to Dallas and other places. Most of his money was spent uh, on a media empire that continues today. And that's not going to train people. That's going to entertain people. It won't train them, though. And uh, and that that's if you could I often wonder if you could go back and sort of if I could advise a dispensationalist in like 1950, like what to do to avoid what happened. 
one of them would be somehow find a way for people like Tim LaHaye and Hal Lindsey to see building new buildings at seminaries and not just starting their own seminaries and media empires as like a really key part of what it would mean to perpetuate the system to the next generation. Other evangelicals, though, a lot of uh, Christian education is struggling right now. Other I was going to say, I just yeah. did two episodes before this one <laughs> uh, just by myself talking about the state of theological education because I taught at yeah. the seminary before this job and um, – once you start seeing under the hood of seminaries, you're just like, whoa, we are really on the brink. Like the yeah. statistics put out by the ATS are sounding the death knell on a lot of schools. So I think I, suspe yeah. I suspect we're in store for major contractions and closures uh, of seminary schools. And one of my concerns then is where does theological education go? Because I think some people will still go to seminary. But you're going to have a lot more of these kind of grassroots like movements and you even have that already and so it'd be interesting to see like how how those engage with with some of this stuff and and if they become the new space for passing it on or whatever yeah that's interesting and yeah maybe maybe dispensationalists just failed like a generation early and everyone's uh coming after them but i do think i mean not to center the place I work, Upper House, but we we see ourselves as as doing theological education for students at UW who otherwise uh, don't have a lot of access to that uh, at the university. And just thinking of the streams of, of theology or even the theologians that we really draw on or biblical scholars, people like uh, N.T. Wright and Scott McKnight and Richard Middleton, and I'm sure you and your listeners are all familiar with these people. Almost all of them have made at least part of their career denouncing dispensationalism. Like yeah. I can find the chapter, you know, the chapters in their books where they're trying to teach against yeah. that view. And so, if that's the future as well, it's probably going to be one that where dispensationalism isn't nearly as as uh, centered as uh, as it as it would be at a, a dispensational seminary or something like that. Yeah, uh, I do want to mention there is there are very small pockets of dispensationalist teaching still happening. And they, they're often at small independent colleges and, and even seminaries that are keeping the flame alive. And there's another version of the future where, for reasons that I can't predict right now, that becomes a new thing that people flock to on a more intellectual level. I don't personally see that, but it's it wouldn't be the first time like some, you know a curveball uh, happens for a historian <laughs> talking about the future. So sure. it's not – so when I when – I, titled it The Fall of Dispensationalism. I did not mean the disappearance or the death of dispensationalism or something like that. It has definitely fallen relative to its prominence in evangelicalism, at least on a scholarly level, from 50 years ago or 60 yeah. years ago. Yeah. But it has not disappeared and it's not dead. And so as long as there's you know, life, you, you just never know um, what, the, what the future holds on some of this stuff either. Yeah, no, I think that's, that's well said. And it's, it's, hard to, it, it's hard to predict because there's so many... Uh, facets to this that are that spider out and whenever you have all the you have all these movements that are kind of like cult of personality movements you know uh where they're starting their own thing and i mean there's it's something so american like you could give back to the seminary that you know shaped you or you could start your own and you know become even more prompt i mean that's so american right and uh so it, it, in some ways it's it's uh i think it's it's tied up with like broader questions of the health of the church in this country and the kind of voices that we give credence to and and invest in our, our time and our money and um yeah so hopefully here's to making better decisions here in the future and listening to <laughs> listening to wiser voices and being open to uh those conversations um i do i do worry about the the ongoing uh, kind of scandal of the evangelical mind, as Mark Knoll talked about, and and just that 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 seems to be, for me as a teacher, that seems to be the most kind of it feels sometimes insurmountable. Like you're just kind of pushing a rock up a hill that you're just never going to get to the top because, um, in the in the in the it's like the soup in which a lot of this stuff bubbled up and 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 flourished. And yeah. it's so hard to find a way to speak into it when the resources that you would use to speak to it are going to be deemed out of bounds because they're coming from, quote unquote, experts or, you know, right. people that right. have PhDs and that's seen as a negative thing. So, 
it's it's a weird it's a weird thing to try to figure out yeah uh, the only uh, i just have two brief thoughts on that one is here at uw i've taught at uw major public university uh no i would say i, I taught a class last year and of the, all this there were probably 15 students only one of them was practicing any type of religion um at all and uh, though many of them grew up in lutheranism or catholicism some of the big ones in in wisconsin but you know some of the troubles i think uh christian educators find in a christian classroom are not much different from the ones i mean they're different in the sense that they're they have a religious tone to them but i think um i don't know i don't know if non you know evangelical students are much different than evangelicals in that they they, they're very skeptical of authority Mm -hmm. they really want to know where are you getting this from uh, there's a lot of guilt by association, so you want to make sure sort of the authors you're reading are themselves somewhat impeccable because students will Google and figure out what this person tweeted, uh, you know, 10 years ago, and then suddenly that whole book is is not worth uh, the time and investment. So anyway, I, th- I think some of that is just um, a broader generational thing. Yeah. I don't know what it is. Uh, and now I'm re- sounding really old, but um, <laughs> something where it's, it's just a challenge of an educator, I guess. Yeah. Um, and then I do, you know, it's it sounds a little trite now, but I do have hope for a more globalized church conversation. Yeah, 100%. In, yeah. Where, where uh, here at, at Upper House, we just did a, a different podcast, a, a podcast series on Christian education and interviewing people who are doing Christian education outside the U.S., it's like a totally different story. It's like they can't build the seminaries fast enough. They can't find enough people to teach. Um, you know, they're, anyway, it's so different than the, the way we, yeah. the, the real situation here in the U.S. So I do have hope in, you know, 20, 30 years, there'll be a much different education landscape where there will be really vibrant theologians and biblical scholars. They just maybe won't be in the places they are, are right now. Yeah, no, that's really well said. Absolutely. Absolutely. That's a good place for us to end on a word of hope um, <laughs> after this conversation. So, hey, thanks so much, Dan. I really appreciate your time. Appreciate the book. Um, really encourage everybody. This is a fantastic, fantastic read. Um, I couldn't put it down once I started reading it. You're really going to enjoy it. And I think for a lot of us, it, it kind of gives a, a little bit of a background to answer like, oh, okay, I, I get it now. I get where that's coming from. You know, for, for me, it was helpful. I, I, I didn't grow up in the church. Um, and so when I first got introduced to evangelical Christianity, it was like all of a sudden the left behind books started showing up on the bookshelf and all that kind of stuff. So for me, it was like I've kind of had to go backwards from – becoming a biblical scholar and now figuring out like, what the heck is this culture? And I'm trying to figure out how to speak to it. So this was super valuable for me. I really enjoyed the book and um, yeah, encourage everybody to get it. Thanks for your scholarship and uh, your ministry. Appreciate you. Thanks. It's been a pleasure talking to you. Yeah. Thanks so much for watching this video. If you enjoyed it, please make sure you subscribe using the link below and check out some more of our videos.